welcome to Physics 9 and 6 times. It's been a while since I uh, re recorded a, an episode of this program. So I thought I would uh, do a bit of a sum up of uh, uh, some of the aspects of our nature. Uh, that is to say, we exist within nature. And nature uh, has very specific characteristics. Now, let's take, for example, the primordial atom, which created space out of nothingness. This is what Lemaitre proposed. That primordial atom, quantum fluctuation, created space where nothing existed before. That is to say, there is nothing outside the boundaries of the universe. Nothingness. Uh, and you can consider this nothingness to be a form of the solid uh, because it, it really uh, is impenetrable. Uh, however, uh, this initial quantum fluctuation that occurred produced particle-antiparticle pair. Antiparticle pair immediately lodges itself at the beginning of time. It's there forever. The particle, as a result of the uh, explosion of this quantum fluctuation, has moved forward in time into this created space and it carries with it a charge. So each time the universe expands and by and large the produce of this expansion are these quantum fluctuations that occur everywhere. Each quantum fluctuation will produce a charged space. What that implies is that the entire universe that we know of is occupied by this space with a residual charge. That sounds an awful lot like the Higgs field. Well, perhaps it is. You see, every time a quantum fluctuation occurs and space is created, that space is charged and it's everywhere. So there are people that talk about how you know, the Higgs field will enter into spaces. No, it's already there. Uh, there are people who talk about the Higgs field uh, emerging into uh, a black hole, say, and what's the interaction there? Well, no, the Higgs field is already present in the black hole. The black hole is comprised of the Higgs field. Higgs field is everywhere, and it's always present. It doesn't occupy spaces, it is space. So, every single part of space will have this charged field. The Higgs field is everywhere. Okay, enough about the Higgs field. Uh, let's talk about uh, utter nonsense in the modern world of physics and how it's leading a lot of bright young people down the garden path. You see, when you pursue a field of study that is being conceptualized, uh, and I think of dark matter and dark energy as cases in point. You wouldn't need either if you had CPT symmetry. And, you know, dark matter and dark energy, well, uh, dark matter is, uh, you know, stuff that you no longer have access to. It's dark because it ain't, it, it ain't visible because it ain't present in the present. As far as dark energy, well, <laughs> what do you think quantum fluctuations are? 
Uh, so people who pursue those lines of research are really pursuing a kind of nonsensical physics. And uh, old, old school physicists will look at that and say, well, I don't know what you're going to do with it. Uh, maybe you can get clever and produce something that looks beautifully symmetrical or, or whatever you happen to want to do your PhD on. But having students, uh, particularly theoretical physics students, pursuing nonsensical aims doesn't do anyone any good. There should be a lot of research being done as to why CPT symmetry was abandoned. Were they good reasons? Because you had a perfect theorem. And uh, it, it, you know, the first two components, charge parity, were shown to uh, not always be the case. And you can't measure time reversal. So, you know, that, that's, that's the big question mark. Uh, but if you examine those uh, refutations of CPT, uh, were you to do so now, do a thorough analysis, you might draw the conclusion that these uh, refutations were pretty flimsy and that the, uh, the theorem should be re-examined re re as a model that best explains how the universe came into being. I don't see this happening anytime soon because the research funding is all going towards these oddball crap things uh, that is modern day physics. Uh, what's the first thing you do when you get your PhD in physics? You apply for a postdoc. And that's literally because uh, the system that created you uh, is going to need to continue to uh, nurture you. Um, because they've given to you uh, a degree uh, that you may or may not have uh, done the work to warrant. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it is <laughs> pretty much a fait accompli that uh, whatever uh, research or analysis that you've done uh, is on the basis of uh, experimental research that is being done in, in the place where you're you know, least likely to uh, encounter either dark matter or dark energy, which is the gravity-rich environment of the universe. So were these uh, conceptual ideas, which is all they are, uh, to indeed exist? We won't find them here. So these experiments with huge water tanks underground in Japan, where they're attempting to measure uh, any particle that they would think of as uh, dark matter or uh, any uh, particular energy signature that they would identify as dark energy, but they found nothing. Why should they find anything? Uh, there's nothing to be found. So, uh, yet uh, physicists are able to persuade governments to give them the money to build these massive and rather useless research facilities, what can you call the Japanese one? A large underground water storage tank, which is about all it is. So, uh, we, are, we are really faced at a crossroads in physics, where we can examine everything we're doing and say, well, this probably doesn't make sense, so let's get rid of it. Uh, this has potential, so we should examine it. And a good example of that is string theory. Uh, because if you embrace it, the Planck unit is a one by one by one cube. Uh, you can put a lot of stuff in there, <laughs> literally. Uh, things that uh, are strings, one Planck unit in length. Uh, that uh, 
they're going to fit into that box, which is the, the Planck unit, and you will get an awful lot of them in it. And so that could very well explain uh, how individual blocks and in building pieces, say, of the universe at the Planck level interact. The problem is there's no, re there's no real way to test it, but it is a compelling idea. Uh, what else uh, can we talk about? Okay, so as I've mentioned in the past, Quantum electrodynamics is a model that is fraught with horrifying fudges. And uh, they all knew it, but they didn't care because the result that they were seeing was so compelling that they thought, well, you know, we, we can work this out over time, but they never did. But QED is, is solid stuff. I, the, the uh, you know, the, the, there's no question that quantum electrodynamics is a fundamental aspect of how our universe works. Well, then there's quantum chromodynamics. Now, quantum chromodynamics uh, is basically taking an analogy uh, of uh, the CIE 1931 colorimetric standard and saying, you know, Quantum chromodynamics really fits in well with this particular system of measuring color. And we are interested in this because we are attempting to explain the behavior of quarks. And it just so happens that the one thing we know about quarks is that they're quark-antiquark -quark pairs. And they're complementary sort of at the other one, at the other end of the color wheel to the, you know, to, 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 to the other one. And uh, it's fascinating, but it's purely speculation. Uh, we do know uh, that um, chromodynamics is a pretty good explainer for uh, quark behavior. And um, the fact that there are so many different types of quarks and uh, they all don't particularly want to have much to do with one another. They're like electrons. Electrons really don't want to be near one another. Uh, they kind of push each other out of the way. Uh, they're uh, an excitable bunch. Well, the quarks are as well. So then you enter into the question, well, you've got, the, you've got your proton and you've got your neutron, and they're both pretty similar in terms of composition, uh, except that uh, one particular set of quarks will produce a positive charge and uh, another set of quarks will produce zero charge. However, uh, that doesn't last. And neutrons rarely stay neutrons for more than, say, a few minutes at the most. And then they change into a proton because they get bombarded by something and they acquire a charge. So they're suddenly a proton. And uh, those quarks inside of the proton and the neutron are being very tightly bound by gluons. Now, there are an awful lot of gluons that are just spinning around doing nothing inside a proton or a neutron. Uh, there are countless number of them, and only a certain number of gluons are needed to ensure that the quarks stay stably attached to one another, and what do the rest do? Willy-nilly. Do as they wish. So, uh, one of the uh, notions, uh, which I happen to support, is that the mass of the particle, uh, in addition to mass that is added to it as it passes through the Higgs field, the mass of the particle is largely comprised of 
all of those extra gluons that are doing nothing but spinning around and wreaking havoc. And by releasing energy, they're basically releasing mass. And uh, so those energetic gluons are what give, in a fundamental way, the, the uh, proton or the, or the neutron its massiveness because of the energy generated by the gluons as they basically spin around doing nothing much. Now this is an interpretation that was referred to as loop quantum gravity, uh, which I call loop quantum gravity type 2. It's a very, very appealing subject matter, well worthy of consideration. I'm going to leave you here because my battery is about to die, uh, but I shall return to regular physics discussions in the near future. So I welcome you to stick around and uh, participate if you will. Thank you. Now let's see if I can switch this thing off. Who is that the button?